For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I really am John Robson. This really is a readout video from our latest email newsletter. And according to Henry Geraitz, COP26 really was important. Just not for the reasons you might think. What really happened there, he said, is that, quote, net zero's magical thinking met unyielding global energy realities and it lost, leaving the Paris Accord's climate ambitions withering on the vine, end quote. Perhaps. Certainly the track record of governments with respect to their lofty climate pledges is not good, for reasons that we have explained at length in various videos, including on the Paris Accord. And perhaps he's right that, quote, sooner or later, our politicians will have to accept, end quote, this reality. But it still matters a good deal whether it's sooner or as seems more likely later, at least in Canada. In the UK, for Prime Minister Boris Johnson, later seems to have arrived. Having characteristically created unnecessary trouble for himself on other fronts, he's extremely vulnerable to the revolt now brewing within his party over high energy prices in a cold winter. His Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, seemed poised to slash energy bills and, who knows, make a run for number 10. It could also be argued that later has arrived for the whole European Union, struggling to respond to Russian pressure on Ukraine, partly because they desperately need Russian natural gas to make up for having badly damaged their own energy sectors. But Geraitz thinks the real issue is even more cosmic. Is the whole climate scare about to come tumbling down along with its occupants? His broadside even targets the science, something that critics of reckless energy policy frequently shy away from, with frequently disappointing results as they seek to rally around the white flag not Geraitz. He channels John Adams that, quote, facts are stubborn things, end quote, then adds, quote, despite decades of alarmist messaging, voters are coming to realize that invariably doom-laden climate science is often political and that climate catastrophes are not unfolding as foretold. People's good sense is insulted when politicians and media routinely blame every conceivable weather event on man's climate sins, end quote. Yeah, as their wallets are injured when politicians attempt to act on those beliefs. And yet, he warns, quote, Canada in particular is dangerously adrift, end quote, in a world where freedom is not just under siege from without, but is being actively undermined from within by those entrusted to preserve it. And as the Toronto Sun just reported, to get to COP26, Canada's Deputy Finance Minister Michael Sabia, quote, who called climate change a massive challenge to humanity, end quote, spent nearly $11,000 in first-class airfare, according to Blacklock's reporter, end quote. He also somehow racked up over 13 grand in expenses in the last three days alone, which frankly sounds exhausting. And don't forget that we sent 276 other people there, not to share the effort, but to conduct one of their own. So they're not hurting. But when will they realize that outside the salon, fossil fuels continue to dominate and gain ground, and those who won't embrace them do badly? We better hope it's sooner. And if you do, join us in challenging the bad science as well as the bad policy. Now, speaking of Canute, which we're not, Seattle had a king tide, which King Canute did not think he was. Instead, a king tide refers to especially high water levels when the gravitational pull of the moon and, yes, the sun, which also affects tides, align to give the ocean a particularly hard yank. And in Seattle, what may have happened may have been an all-time record with coastal flooding, so got that climate change, right? or wrong, because actually it was a low pressure area associated with lack of heat that pulled the sea up just that little bit more this time. As Cliff Mass observes, the sea in Washington state has been rising steadily for the last 120 years, not accelerating. Nothing to see here, folks, and plenty of observers to think they saw it. So what should we do? Some say leap into committee. There's a persistent illusion in public policy that the reason governments haven't delivered all the swell stuff they promised at a price we can afford is that they haven't tried hard enough. Some blame lack of will, others point to sinister vested interests, and yet others say, well, we just haven't found the right administrative configuration. So Mark Morano of Climate Depot notes sardonically, we're saved because the Biden White House just tweeted that, quote, today seven federal agencies are announcing clean energy projects and plans that will activate the entire government to fight climate change, lower energy costs, create good paying union jobs, and accelerate America's clean energy economy, end quote. Ooh, activate the entire government to work as a hyper-efficient one big interdepartmental committee. Sure thing, guys. Let us know how it turns out if it ever even gets out of the committee room. And now, a word from our sponsor, and that's you. Because at the Climate Discussion Nexus, we're dependent upon support from our viewers and our readers. Please go to our donate page, make a one-time pledge, or if you can, a monthly one. 
I'm not talking a lot of money though. If you've got it, we'll take it. $2 a month, $3, $5. That's the sustaining funding that we need to produce these videos on our newsletter. And now, back to me. Meanwhile, we want to add to last week's This Time For Sure Climate Breakdown Roundups with the New York Times Climate Forward feature that joins in with, quote, we mapped a year of extreme weather, end quote, during which, quote, temperatures in the United States last year set more heat and cold records than any other year since 1994, end quote. Ooh, heat and cold since 1994. So just the usual kind of oscillating. Well, Eric Wall asks, quote, can you tell what the previous year's weather was like by reading the latest climate science doomsday press releases, end quote? And since the essence of science is prediction, we add, quote, can you tell us what next year's disasters will be? Or do you already predict things after they already happened? See, if there are more wildfires than usual in some place, the usual suspects will blame climate change and go, duh. But does it mean the same place will have more wildfires than usual in the coming year? Who knows? Same thing with floods, cold snaps, heat domes, or oobleck. But whatever did happen, they'll grab it and call it proof positive of, like, whatever man. Even if it's only the most notable since 1994, a reference year picked in the same randomly belligerent fashion. In this week's newsletter, we also note that three famous climate scientists threatened to stop doing research on climate until we admit that no more research is needed. Except they aren't famous, and they won't stop even if we say, deal. But we say it anyway. Judith Curry sighed in exasperation, how does stuff like this get published, end quote. But we ask, how do we hold them to it once it is? They're actually a professor in the School of People, Environment, and Planning at Massey University, a professor of environmental planning at the University of Waikato, and a professor of sustainability at the University of the Sunshine Coast. None of which strike us as disciplines genuinely open to a diversity of conclusions, let alone approaches. And they claim, quote, there is an unwritten social contract between science and society, end quote, in which they are science and kept their word to be all hysterical about some issue, and society is governments, which didn't keep their end of the bargain by doing whatever the hysterics said they had to. Such humility. But we, as part of society, never signed that deal. And when they threaten to hold their breath until they turn blue instead of green, we say, go right ahead. Now really, they say, quote, we call for a moratorium on climate change research that does little more than document global warming and maladaptation. We call for a halt on all further IPCC assessments until governments are willing to fulfill their responsibilities in good faith and mobilize action to secure a safe level of global warming. This option is the only way to overcome the tragedy of climate change science, end quote. Well, yeah, except the option where you shut up and we don't care. That one works for us. If, on the other hand, real science is going to continue, one important question for the open-minded is whether, if the weather is currently turbulent, it indicates a break with the past or more of the same. So check out this picture, courtesy of a reader's Facebook post. It's a chart that comes from that hotbed of climate lack of denialism, the U.S. Governmental National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, specifically its climate.gov site. And then prepare to laugh out loud when someone talks about the hottest year ever or claims climate was stable until 1970. Now, sure, some people might go Greta on us, to borrow a phrase from a viewer, and say, look, when Equatorial Pangaea was too hot for peat swamps, it might have been kind of nasty. I mean, what would flourish under those circumstances other than dinosaurs, who first appear in the fossil record around 240 million years ago and began their meteoric rise to glory? Well, maybe I shouldn't mention meteors around dinosaurs, after the Triassic-Jurassic extinction event around 201.3 million years ago. Ah, extinction. Yeah, but after a long cooling stretch and not because of temperature, as far as anyone can tell. As for the Cretaceous hot greenhouse, well, boo, greenhouse. Except it saw flowering plants appear, symbiotically with those incredibly cool horned dinosaurs, and a bit less symbiotically with T-Rex. This chart also, oddly, suggests that the current ice age, meaning a period with significant polar ice, has been going on not for the conventional 2.5 million years, but more than 30 million and that an ominous cooling trend has been going on for many millions of years with mass extinction written all over its end point. And if you Google Eocene fauna, and then realize you meant Oligocene, which Google says was from about 33.9 million years ago to 23 million years ago, you realize that those much warmer temperatures didn't create Al Gore's semi-famous nature hike through the Book of Revelation, but rather led to a period when, quote, carnivores such as dogs, nimravids, ancestors of cats, bears, weasels, and raccoons began to replace the creodonts, end quote, 
Although some cool big things like the brontotheres bit the dust as it got somewhat cooler than it had been in the Eocene. I could go on and on, and you may think I already did. But the point is that if you actually study the past history of Earth's climate, you discover that it's highly variable, that it's normally much warmer than today, and that cold conditions are not favorable to life. In order to be sure, sudden temperature swings either way. But this kind of chart sure helps to put terms like unprecedented and, and hottest ever into perspective, or into the graveyard. This week's newsletter also continues our 1920 or 2020 Australian tour with a trip to Adelaide. So go ahead, make my day. Tell me which of these is pre-climate crisis 1920 and which the heat-blasted wasteland of 2020. Take that, Oligocene. And speaking of things teetering toward extinction, climate models are still very unclear and prone to tendentious guesswork on how much greenhouse gases warm the planet. And one reason why is that they also don't know how much aerosols, which aren't deodorants but microscopic pollution particles, cool it. Most climate breakdown alarmism relies on the idea that GHGs are potent heating elements, and only a lot of 20th century aerosols fighting back produce the very limited real-world warming that actually happened. But here's the thing. They basically make up both numbers and then kludge the thing to match the historical record. Which is odd, because we know that most 20th century aerosol pollution happened in the Northern Hemisphere. So, checking the model outputs per hemisphere against the data should show us which ones have the aerosols roughly right, and therefore, the GHGs. And guess what? A 2021 study, led by Chen Gong Wang of Princeton, did precisely that and found a small gap. Meaning, the aerosol cooling effect is limited, and so, necessarily, therefore, is greenhouse gas warming. Who saw that one coming? Oh, shucks, folks. It was us. Finally, we present a study from CO2Science.org that could, with a bit more poetry in someone's soul, have been called When Birds Head for the Hills, because it examined the extent to which the breeding range of boreal forest birds shifted upward to avoid deadly warmth after an original survey in 1974, and then they went and looked again in the middle of the 2010s. They actually found more species, which is proof of more biodiversity, more care and counting, or better luck finding birds. They also found some birds went up the hill, a smaller number went down, some expanded their range, and some contracted theirs. In short, no big thing, and certainly not what the scary models predicted, with the birds being pushed to the tip top of the mountain and then dumped off it. Okay, I'll say it. Climate change is for the birds, not against them. And there's something you can tweet. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson. 